Heavenly Father, how we thank you and praise you for the wonderful gift of your word. We thank you for the independence that we celebrate today, Father. First of all, independence uh, from the uh, interference and meddling of other nations, but Father, that sovereignty which you've given this nation, Lord, we praise you for that freedom and the freedoms that are provided by it. But more, more importantly, Lord, we praise you for the freedom that you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for this time and pray you'd bless our study this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, today we get to talk about an important passage that is uh, obviously critical to all of us, but we've had a month off, so we definitely need to get back into the swing. But one of my favorite uh, things to do is to read biographies, particularly of our nation's founding fathers. And Benjamin Franklin, there's a wonderful uh, biography written about him, and a story is told that he would wake up early in the morning and start working, but he'd make sure and did all of his pen and paper book work at first. And then when, it was, when everybody was up and about, then he'd go do the labor work because he figured if he was going to go be carrying and moving heavy things, bags and so forth, then he ought to get credit for it. And it worked. People thought, oh, what a wonderful, hardworking man that Benjamin Franklin is because he did all of his work to be seen by men. Now, that was maybe shrewd, right? Because he was just trying to get people to think and see him as being hardworking in the community. Um, we see this also with big companies very frequently, right? Big companies will uh, give tens, hundreds, millions of dollars, but they make sure you know about it, right? We gave this much to this charity and this much to that charity. They make sure they're putting it up on a plaster. Why? Because they're only doing it so that you will buy more of their product, right? They're just doing it to, to fanfare before people. And today's passage gives us a very different view on charitable giving, that it's not something to be done for the uh, benefit of the one you're giving it to, and it's not something that is to be done for the benefit of the giver in terms of uh, whatever praise you can amount to your account publicly, but it is for God and for God alone. So that's our picture, but we have to remember where we were in context as well. We're seeing this wonderful Sermon on the Mount, as we've seen, often misinterpreted, beaten, bruised, and changed in its entire meaning because of misunderstanding. There we go. Because of misunderstanding. And yet we see that this, here, this is Jesus' comment on how these people, these Jewish people, needed to approach God in their time and how to prepare them for the tribulation period should that come. So we see that as the context of what Jesus is saying, and he, he uh, started off with those positive expectations in the Beatitudes, showing these wonderful uh, different uh, char uh, character traits and ways in which we can act, again, poor in spirit and being those who mourn, being comforted, all that beautiful kind of positive information. He defended his teaching in 5, 17 through 20, essentially because there were people out there who were saying that he doesn't teach the law well. He, they said he destroys the law with his teaching, which was a common Hebraism. But he instead says, no, I fulfill the law, meaning to teach the law correctly. So he was there correcting all of their tradition, all the things that they had piled on to, uh, to the Word of God, to the Torah over the years with their tradition. And then he made that shocking statement that blew everyone's hair back, that their righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. And you can imagine the gasp in the crowd as everyone would fall over and... <gasps> How could you say be more righteous than the Pharisees? They were the most righteous. They were the best. They were the top of the heap. If you wanted to know something about what God wanted, you'd go to the Pharisees. And then Jesus explained that position. He talked about through murder, adultery, divorce, swearing oaths, retaliation, and loving of enemies. He showed them how their legalistic, sad Pharisee religious leadership was actually falling far, far short of the righteousness of God. So interestingly, obviously, the ultimate point will be that we always need the righteousness of Christ. He was pointing out, your, your Pharisees aren't very authentic. The Pharisees aren't very genuine. The Pharisees and Sadducees, those religious leaders, were basically just using it as a way to get respect, power, money for themselves, and leaving the true faith off on its own. So he's actually correcting a heart attitude within the nation of Israel. So with that, we get into this uh, more positive section where having criticized their uh, not showing the love and the life and the maturity of God uh, in chapter 5, now he's going to talk about the positive disciplines, the positive things that a, a believer will do, and he is um, showing how that it's not 
uh, to be done the way that they were doing it. So service is covered in 1 through 4, prayer in 5 through 15, fasting in 16 through 18, and then a summary verse in 19 through 21. And we're going to slow down and spend just a little bit more time here because while Jesus is teaching about prayer, particularly with a perspective to relig- religious life in Israel at that time, it's always helpful for us to also take some time and talk about these same things because they're important for us in the church today. So today we just look at service. And we're going to start off by talking about the idea of rewards. We may be tempted largely to think of the idea of rewards as being a a New Testament concept, and that's because there's a little bit more information about where New Testament believers are rewarded. But what we see is that the, the idea of rewards is continued throughout the Bible. Psalm 5811 says, So that men will say, Surely there is a reward for righteousness. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. So this is probably more with a view towards the fact that God rewards a righteous life with uh, results. And that was especially true in the nation of Israel because they were under a covenant of God that promised, distinct from our relationship with God in the church, that promised if they were faithful, they would be blessed. They were faithful In spiritual things, they would be given uh, great material wealth, safety, security, comfort, and the like. But this idea that God recompenses or rewards our behavior is critical to a biblical understanding of the world. Proverbs 25.22 says, For you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, this is talking about how to deal with an enemy, right? And and, uh, in the the larger context of the proverb. He's telling him to be good to your enemies. And then he says, in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. In other words, if you really want to think about it that way, it's the most, in, uh, the most wounding thing you can do is be gracious to him and show him love. Because if he still chooses to hate you after that, then it will just burn him up inside. And it says, and the Lord will reward you. You're not looking for the reward of being able to manipulate or use others. Um, Jesus will continue this talk throughout uh, Matthew. Matthew 10.41, it said, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And then to the end of that, he shall by no means lose his reward. Uh, 16.27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with the angels and he will reward each according to his work. So here talking about clearly eternal rewards still within the context of Israel. Moving into the church age, we get more clear instruction on this. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. So we see even within the faith that we are to be rewarded for the life that we lead in faith. That as we walk in faith in Christ and bring forth the fruit of the Spirit and those good works, that the Lord is paying attention and bringing forth a reward. 1 Corinthians 3.14, that same passage says, if anyone's work he has built on it, that is the foundation of our salvation in Christ, he will receive a reward. Colossians 2.18 encourages these believers not to believe in the lies of the Gnostic heretics that were attacking them. And he says, let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, including those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So here, again, the picture is your salvation is free. You placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You trusted in Him for salvation. You were forgiven all sins, past, present, and future. You are headed towards glory land. The rapture is your uh, hope, just as the rest of us. But how we live matters. There's now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, but when we walk by means of His Spirit, when we walk in His grace, when we are obedient to His Word, God says, that is rewardable. And we say, but Lord, you've done everything. You're the one who saved me and made me rewardable. You're the one who's working in me through your Spirit, your Word, your church. Why do I get the reward? He goes, exactly. That's exactly what it's about. And don't let anyone cheat you out of that reward by taking the lies of man-made religion. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
In 2 John 2, uh, 8, verse 8 rather, looks, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for so that we may receive a full reward. What to take away from this idea? Your life matters. You're not just treading water and waiting for the rapture. You're not just sitting around waiting, but rather the Lord sees and is attentive to every attitude and thought and word of your mouth and movement of your uh, life. And He longs to reward you for good and faithful duty, for good and faithful response. This is not a punishment or reward ceremony. Quite to the contrary, as we find in um, 1 Corinthians 3, that the bad works, they're burned up, they're eviscerated, they just go away. They're just wasted time. But everything that you've done by faith in Christ, walking by faith in Him and obedience to His Word is a rewardable act. So when we look at this on the timeline, we know that believers are uh, rewarded at the Bema seat of Christ. We see that Israel and the nations who survived the tribulation, tribulation are rewarded at the advent of the kingdom, right? This is, we'll get to look at this in great depth. This is the judgment of the sheep and the goats and the like. And then we see that um, all of these, and, and I would, we don't know for sure, I certainly don't know for sure, but I would guess that resurrected Israel would also be or, uh, rewarded in this time. And it's all preparing us, all of the rewarding is preparing us for the future rule and reign glorifying do you see? This is the point, that you're meant to be built up in this life in order to serve God, in order to serve Christ in His kingdom to come. A lot of time we see pictures of heaven as, as being, uh, you know, sitting on clouds, or, or maybe we think about it as just sitting on a beach for all time. But rather than that, I hope you think of this coming kingdom as a time to serve, to use all of your gifts, all of your abilities, all of your creativity, everything that you built and, uh, and, and were grown in in this life, being put into action for all of eternity. You're being prepared for a role in the kingdom. So when we think about these rewards, it makes me think of uh, C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And at one point, as the, the evil witch's power is breaking, Father Christmas is able to come. You know, Santa Claus, but we, he wouldn't call him that. Father Christmas uh, comes, and he says, Peter, Adam's son, one of the main characters, four main children. Here, sir, he said, these are your presents, was the answer, and they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver, and across it, there was a ramped red lion, and a bri as bright as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was gold, and it had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present." Now, obviously, that's a gift, but it gives us that idea of what the rewards are about. You see, God saves us and gives us the, the power through His Holy Spirit and His Word to earn the rewards, and then we take those rewards and, and those crowns and pour them or throw them down at the feet of Jesus to glorify Him. We use those rewards to then serve Him more in the kingdom to come. And that's a lot of the problem with the way that rewards have been taught frequently in the church. You get this idea that you're going to get a beamer, a better car, a better house, or a better something in the next life, and that misses the point entirely. It is solely and entirely for the glory of God. So the more that you glorify God, the more that you're able to glorify God in the life to come, which is the purpose for which we were created and redeemed. And when we lose that picture of it, we lose the full biblical idea of rewards, and we get into what? That sort of self-motivated, I'm going to do good stuff so that I can get more stuff, which is not a biblical motivation. You see, when it comes to this, it's always a question of motivation. He says here, take heed that you do, do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Oftentimes, we might wonder, how can I know if I have an authentic, serious faith, if my works of right, righteousness, the things that I do to serve the Lord, are in fact to glorify God and not somehow deceptively for my own glory? You can know by the attitude that you take. Jesus is giving you, in, in this, giving uh, uh, his audience rather, a perfect litmus test to understand. 
But he starts with this wonderful word, prosakete. Uh, <laughs> I say it too fast. Prosakete. And this idea is to be, pl- uh, it's plural, present, active, imperative, right? So he's plural. He's talking to everybody. It's present. It's right now. It's something that he expects them to be thinking of right now. It's active. It's something that they're meant to be doing. And it's an imperative. It's a command. He's telling them, you want to come out on the right side of this thing, be careful. In fact, the idea is to hold this in front of your eyes. Hold this idea, scrutinize it, think about it, right? And we're going to see, he's asking them to scrutinize their spiritual life. Consider your spiritual life. If your uh, walk with Christ does not involve some series of moments wherein you get to take stock of your walk with him, wherein you sit and pray and think, what, am I, what is my relationship with Christ like? What are my attitudes? What are my thoughts? Scrutinize your uh, attitudes is what he's telling them. Now we get into a fun little textual variant. Um, If you have a New King James or a King James, you'll see something, or a uh, modern English version, you'll see something to the effect of do not do your charitable deeds. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, And if you have a a New American Standard, something that uses the critical text, um, ESV or the like, you'll see righteousness here in this verse. So, Moreover, the ancient texts have the word dikaiosune, which is righteousness, and the majority text has our word alalemosune, which is alms, which is where we get the the word alms. So all the texts agree in the next given verses that alms is what's meant to be uh, put into place. But just here, we see a slight uh, distinction. The critical text makes uh, this statement sort of an overview for the entire section, right? So if you have uh, righteousness there, it's like this is my, my change of direction, you know, uh, topic statement, and then he's going to go through and talk about what that means. And if you're, you know, in the um, King James, it's more of just a topic statement for the four verses here. So it doesn't make any large difference. The inter- interesting thing is at the end, the Jewish concept of doing tzedakah or uh, acts of righteousness would always come down to and involve the idea of doing alms. So from a Jewish perspective, these words would have been entirely interchangeable within this context. So it shows us another time where we see a textual variant that is of absolutely no significant meaning difference, um, but also ultimately comes down to be being sort of a wash in terms of what it means. We keep mentioning these things because I want you to know when you hear on the History Channel or whatever it is that there's thousands and thousands of disagreements and errors in the Bible, copy errors in the Bible, I want you to know what is actually there and what those disagreements, whatever side you wind up taking, they're always insignificant in value so that the lies of this world, the misrepresentations and the spin of the media doesn't give you a wrong idea about what's going on there. All right. And then he says, to be seen by men. Actually, he's incredibly emphatic. Don't do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. He's pointing out his serious, passionate, emphatic point, right? Don't do it in front of men in order to be seen by men. Now, let's hold on a minute and note that there are some advantages to being seen by men. If you do your good works before others and everyone else knows and sees those great things that you're doing, then they're likely to think you're a good person, that you're trustworthy, that you're honest. They might, might think that you're good to do business with. It might help your standing within the community. There's lots of really good reasons to do your good, righteous works before men. So before we pass this off and don't think about it, recognize that this is a very real temptation for us. When we do something good by someone else, when we help someone else, we we, we always have to fight that that temptation to sneak over and say, yeah, tell someone else, yeah, I, I did that. Or, or maybe just drop it casually into a conversation. Oh, yes, I was, uh, I was up all night helping, helping Bob last night. You know, Bob's having some trouble, but I was helping him, right? What are we doing? We want to be seen by men. We want, to, we want to tell others every good thing we do. Why? Well, as we'll see, it is practical atheism. It's that God may or may not exist, and He may or may not ever reward us, but I can at least get the rewards of everybody think I'm a pretty cool guy. 
around here. The Pharisees and the Sadducees did everything to be seen by men. They worked out every situation so that they would get credit for every act of righteousness, every work of righteousness. Washing hands for crying out loud would be a public ceremony. Everything would be a public ceremony so that they could be seen as the extra super duper godly righteous ones, the authorities, the ones who you should give your money to, the ones who you should trust or obey. The whole system was designed, and the whole culture had accepted it. You got, you, we can't fully understand or imagine how revolutionary these words of Christ were. When they said, uh, when they said that, or when Jesus said, rather, that your righteousness had to exceed that of the Pharisees, they would have said, I don't have the time. I don't have the talent to learn what they've learned. I don't have the time to obey. I don't have the money, the wealth to do what they do. I could never, I mean, we just praise God that they can do it on behalf of all of us. And so this idea of this hierarchy based on external religious works was sort of an accepted public policy. And it's not that much different today. Then he says what is undoubtedly the most shocking thing. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Understand what Jesus is saying. These legalists, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these people who are put up in front of everybody as the spiritual role models, as the ones to look up to but never to attain, the ones to see and see all the good righteous things they're doing, the way that they're tithing and giving the exact, and they're fasting extra and they're doing all these religious actions, those ones to look up to, he says that all of their works are for show and he's saying to them, your spiritual leaders are spiritually bankrupt. Can you imagine the shudder that would go through the crowd? Everyone that they'd looked up to, everyone that they'd given money to, everyone who they'd supported in the religious community of Israel was being said to be religiously, spiritually bankrupt. That while you looked around and marveled at the great things they did, that God looked and said, that's worthless. That is a zero account. Nothing logged, nothing to reward there. This should be shocking and, and undoubtedly was shocking and, and terrifying to the people because they all of a sudden had to start thinking, as I hope you and I start to think, what about all the good things I do? What, what about that? I mean, someone's, I, I, I thought it was okay to get double credit. I thought it was okay. I thought God was up there cheering with them about that good thing that I did in front of everybody else. And he's pointing out the reality that if it's not for God and God alone... Now, are you going to get caught doing something good? I hope so. hope you're doing enough good to, to get caught. Most aren't. But the question is, again, about your motivation. So now we come up to when you do a charitable deed. So the King James Version has to do thine alms, the NASB 2020, to give to the poor, the Net Bible to do charitable giving, and the ESV to give to the needy. So the, the reason why we want to point this out here is that he's very clearly, specifically talking about the area of giving, uh, giving to the poor, which is a very important part and still is of Jewish life and religion and culture. It's this same word that is used for the, uh, the man in Acts 2, uh, three, two through four. It says, a certain lame man came from his mother's womb and was carried, whom they laid daily at the gates of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms, right? So that's our word here again. And uh, fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. So this is actually a cool passage, parallel passage, for two reasons. One, it uses that same word and shows that this Greek word was used for the idea of giving alms to the poor, right, for spiritual purposes. Um, but also it shows us something about the culture that was, was hiding behind it. You see, Peter walks up to him and says, look at us, which would be expected if he was actually not just trying to get the guy to look at him, but have everyone, look at me, look at us. We're going to give him, and what did the guy expect? He thought he was going to receive a big gift. 
because he's trying to draw this attention. In other words, what this meant, Peter doesn't have this attitude. Peter is going to heal him in the name of Jesus Christ to the glory of Jesus Christ. But the point is, is that we see in this, uh, stay in this little moment of time, the reality that, God, that, that this man is expecting that he's trying to draw a crowd so that he can give a big gift, so he can make sure he gets all the credit possible for it, so that he can stride away with a grin on his face and his, mag, his magnanimous gesture, you know. And yet, obviously, that's not what's going on, but that's the, that's the principle that Jesus is dealing with. In speaking of this, the Jewish encyclopedia says that this is a word designed from the Greek word eleemousin, muse, sorry, mercifulness, uh, used by Greek-speaking Jews to denote an almost exclusively the offering of charity to the needy, from the feeling of both compassion and righteousness, zedekah, that's the word we looked at before, the word almsgiving. However, it is far from expressing the full meaning of the Hebrew zedekah, which is charity in the spirit of uprightness or justice. According to the Mosaic conception, wealth is a loan from God, and the poor have a certain claim to the possessions of the rich, while the rich are positively enjoined to share God's bounties with the poor. So here's the Jewish perspective, right, on this same idea. Point being that this is a passage that is particularly talking about what we give to those in need. And then we have this uh, easy to misunderstand picture. We might imagine, right, and actually it's why this picture is so powerful, that someone was walking and had trumpets blowing before them, something possibly like this uh, shofar horn, and, and blowing trumpets just, uh, just like we described the man in Acts 3 probably expected, but someone who's drawing attention to every wonderful act of giving that they'd ever done. And again, draw to, to it. Uh, your attention, the various companies that are doing things or, or mega multi-million dollar organizations that are giving just the amount they need to to get the tax break they want, but then they want to make sure they also plaster it around everywhere. Well, they're not giving for God's glory anyway, so it's hard to you know, criticize them for that, but it should show us that while that's okay by the world's standards, because the world is an awful godless place, it's not okay for the child of God to take that attitude. The Complete Jewish Study Bible, however, points out that this, these, this idea of just trumpeting in this uh, kind of a, a fanfare or an, a hyperbole is probably not actually what Jesus had in mind. Uh, the Complete Jewish Study Bible reads, in Matthew 6, 1 through 4, Jesus warns the disciples about sounding the trumpet. Don't announce the trumpets or with trumpets when giving alms. The word alms was a synonym for charitable, give, chariti, charitable gift given to the poor during the first century. In the temple at this time, there were 13 collection boxes for alms. They were wide at the bottom and narrow at the top and resembled trumpets. These boxes made a recognizable sound as the coins were dropped into them, and often those who wished to boast would drop a large number of coins in at once. This, this was called sounding the trumpet. It was this practice of letting everyone know how much they were giving that Yeshua opposed. You see the picture here, Right? You come in with a big handful of coins to drop in, and they've got these 13. Well, I guess, hey, everybody, listen up. Shh. Chink, 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 chink. As if everybody else needs to see your good work, right? It, is, it sounds like an absurdity, but again, if you live in a, in a world where you're trying to publicly motivate people to good works so that they can receive the earthly rewards, it kind of makes sense. And mercy, it's everywhere in the church today. There's very uh, countless people who will give great amounts but feel as if then they're entitled to some sort of glory, recognition, or control in the situation. That's not grace giving. That's not gracious giving. That's giving to get something. And so Jesus then uses this powerful phrase, word against them. They are hypocrites. Now, Originally, the word hypocrite, and it's hypocrites, it's, it sounds the same, it's, it's not translated, it's transliterated, but a hypocrite originally in Greek was not a negative thing in ancient or classical Greek, it was an actor or an orator, and so someone who could uh, <laughs> hypocrite well was someone who could speak well, and, and yet it came to be known as simply an actor, not genuine, someone who was false or not who they appeared to be, Right? So it's one of Jesus' favorite top character criticisms or condemnations is that someone would be an actor. Someone is carrying around the idea and the appearance and they want everyone to think that they're so holy and yet inside they're a festering, rotting tomb 
filled with nothing but a corpse, spiritually speaking. Jesus used this commonly, Matthew 15, 7, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying again to the spiritual or the religious leaders of his day, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's exactly what Jesus is dealing with here, right? He's taking all the extra rules and the commandments of men and the ways that they found to make themselves look and feel more self-righteous and more powerful over others, to leverage that over others. And he said, no, they're teaching commandments of men. They're not truly even teaching the Word of God. Matthew 23, 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you judge, uh, uh, shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in, right? In this discourse, which we'll look at in some months to come, Jesus is going to pronounce these Pharisees, hypocrites, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, seven times. And why do you think this is such a big deal? Well, don't forget Matthew, or Levi, was a tax collector. You see, he was the one most shut out. He was a part of that group of tax collectors and sinners that were most shut out by that religious world. By the, that religious world, by taking sides with Rome to collect taxes for Rome, was the most disgusting act of treason you could ever take up. And so a tax collector like Levi was certainly the lowest in their spiritual caste system of which they were the top. So you know that every time Jesus Christ called out these religious leaders that would bar the gates of heaven from the needy and from the spiritually failing and faltering, called them out for their hypocrisy, you know that his mind was on record every moment. The hypocrisy of these external works to gain clout or attention or the praise of men is unacceptable to God. But then we ask, well, why are they acting? Well, they're acting to gain glory from men. God, religion, is just a path. He's just a tool for them to get more glory. And surely, even in their most honest moment, they could justify it and say, well, you know, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not very authentic, but we're doing better than, better than if we weren't doing it, right? We're doing some good, aren't we? We're encouraging some people to a more holy living, aren't we? And they just don't get it. They want the reward of the prestige and honor looking up a men so they'll do the things that make them look good before other people, and God tells them they have their reward. They've got it. It's done. They were cheated out of nothing. They might have had delusions in that their own quest for self-recognition, for their quest for honor among men would somehow also bring heavenly uh, reward, And that's exactly what we do when we're not in a right relationship with God. What do we do? We look and say, oh my goodness, I can't deal with my sinfulness. I can't deal with my... But maybe if I could just fool you into thinking I'm super spiritual, maybe God will be fooled too. Right? We, we, for whatever reason, because we don't get a direct response revelation from God in terms of thumbs ups and thumbs downs on every action, it's very easy for us to then just assume that God must see things the way everyone else sees things, or rather, God must see things the way everybody else, uh, I perceive that everyone else sees things. But either one is wrong. You can fool all of the people. You can fool the entirety of planet Earth. You can fool your church into thinking you're righteous. righteous. You can fool your family into thinking you're righteous and still be a self-absorbed, self-glorifying, self-worshipping fool. And for every good thing that you did, for every Bible verse you memorized, for every uh, meal you catered, God will say, you have your reward in full. Made you feel good. Made you feel better about yourself. Well, the good Lord does not dwell too long on the negative and moves us to doing charity correctly in the coming verses. He says, but when you... Remember, he's juxtaposing them and the spiritual leaders. But when you, common, normal folk who are actually living the life, 
not these ridiculous elites that are strutting around like peacocks. When you do a charitable deed, charitable deed do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and that your Father who sees in secret will Himself reward you openly. This picture is so common to us because we hear these words quoted so frequently, the power of it can be missed. Both your hands are on your body, and both your hands are controlled by the same brain. So to keep a secret from your left hand with your right hand shows the utmost degree of humility. To not even be thinking about it yourself. This is the attitude of true godly giving. Because whether you're giving uh, money or food to someone in need, or whether you're uh, contributing to a, a ministry or something else that the Lord is doing that you want to support, you're doing it for God's glory, not yours. You're doing it because you want to glorify and honor God, and you don't care. Who gets the credit? That's the picture. Charity done correctly is done in absolute anonymity. And you know what happens when you do that? God gets the glory. I hope at some point you've received a, a gift or, or even just a card, a kindness from someone anonymously within the church. And the first thing you think is, I've got to find out who does this so I can write them a thank you note. But that's exactly why they didn't let you know so that you could only praise and thank God for that wonderful gift. You say, but if I'm going to make deacon, then I better get caught doing some of these things. No, false. It's not about getting credit. It's why I will tell you right now, I never, never, never will know what one of you is giving to this church. By God's grace, Steve and Don take care of that. I never have to see you can give a million dollars or one. You can serve a thousand hours or zero. I don't care. Because ultimately, you shouldn't be giving for any other reason than in the grace response to all that God has done for you and your desire to be a part of what He is doing. Doing charity right means entirely anonymous so that God can gain all the glory and it can never be about you. And then He moves on and says, Your Father kind of uh, continuing a wonderful theme from Travis's last message, God always introduced Himself as Israel's father and called them his, his firstborn. That continues on, as we'll see in a future study to us. But God describing Himself as a father was Him pointing out that God has this loving, caring relationship with His people. Children naturally look to and look for the approval of their parents. Oftentimes when they rebel in later years, it's because they, they feel they've never received it. They couldn't live up to it. And that's exactly the picture that God wants to make. He said it's not worth looking. It's not worth getting the approval of your friends and neighbors. It's not worth getting the approval and praise of the other people who sit next to you in church. God's approval alone is meaningful in this life. And oh, how free you will be and how free I will be as we learn to realize that, that all the nattering, nagging, whining, obnoxious snots that cover this earth, their opinion is meaningless in the face of God's truth and obeying God and God alone. So you don't need to run around hoping you please or satisfy or make everyone happy or entertain every whiny complaint and demand because ultimately you're responsible to God and to God alone for that approval. And that's how you should give on the positive. Why? Because God sees the secrets. God sees them. He sees that act of kindness. He sees that time that you, moved by the Spirit, share with that person in need on the street. He sees that, that, that moment when your heart bends towards caring for a brother or a sister-in-law or someone else who is in, in great need. He sees it and he marks it down. It's, it's important to him. It's precious to him. I go to 
as many of my kids' baseball games as I can, and I don't care if they hit a home run or strike out every time. I just love to see them have fun and do something good. So it is with the Father. He loves to see what is done in secret, and He loves to know that you did it just for His uh, glory. And He is the one who rewards. We, uh, again, our earthly parents may or may not have been wonderful rewarders. They might have been more disciplinarian or whatever it is. But God is telling us something about His character, or rather Christ is telling us something about the Father's character here, and that's that He longs to reward you. He's cheering for you. He's cheering for the right thing to happen, the right attitude to come about. So, we get out of this passage as many. Obviously, the primary focus was to point out to these people that their uh, system of religion as a social hierarchy or some sort of social credit system was not effective. It was not working. It was not God's view. But the rather that they need to look away from the outward religion and the outward displays of religion and look down to the real heart and ask, who are you glorifying? Are you trying to glorify yourself? Are you trying to avoid punishment? Are you trying to bring glory uh, to God and God alone because of His grace? When you, <clears throat> charity is not meant to impress others. Charity is meant to flow out from family. That's right. In, a, in the New Testament context, you're meant to care for your family first. Family and extended family would be meant by that. You're meant to care for your church family. And that love and care is meant to go out into your community and onward to the ends of the earth. When you work to serve God and God alone, not caring one iota who gets the credit, not having to tell one person about the good deed you did today, you let Him manage the reward rather than choosing it the reward for yourself. And I will tell you, the approval of men is always sorely disappointing. And I can prove it to you. Look at the upper echelons of our society, the politicians, the actors, the, the, the train wrecks of human lives that are, have all the approval of men. They're hollow. They're empty. They're wasted. They're lost. They're hopeless. Every day you turn over a new page and find out another one has an, another horrible addiction or another horrible uh, set of actions or they were doing something unspeakably terrible. Why? Well, because the approval of men does not bring satisfaction. Everybody else thinking you're great just leaves you feeling empty if you don't understand that it's for God and God alone. Paul, we'll close with this. Paul in Galatians 1.10 gave us this idea. He says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Jesus' message was true for His people, they needed to get away from these ridiculous, self-righteous externals of religiosity and come to the grace and whole, full love of Christ. And so it is true today. We wake up tomorrow and choose to be a bondservant of Christ, not caring a whit for the approval, affection, or admiration of others, but to long to glorify God with every step of your day the very moment of your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you and we thank you that you have taught us so clearly in your word. You've told us the attitude we're meant to take, the way in which we're meant to view you, the way in which we're meant to view each other, to serve and love one another without any desire for recognition or fame. We praise you and we thank you that your rewarding is better than any reward we could ever conceive of or work for ourselves. Please motivate us with this humility of heart by the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.